we are now into our third module uh, of this series. The first two modules um, were uh, uh, the were modules on initially on ultrasound basics, on instrumentation, on ultrasound physics, and then we started moving into focused applications. So this first, the first one we did was on um, scanning for fetal presentation, which is a common thing that comes up. Um, and the one we are going to do today, part three in our series, is on uh, scanning uh, or performing ultrasound, point of care ultrasound for determination of amniotic fluid volume. So. Our audience today, a mix of group, mixed group of people. We have students, we have residents. Um, this could be for attendings. Anyone who wants to use this uh, as a tool in their office practice. Um, and as we mentioned, this is our third part, amniotic fluid volume. So has everyone taken the pretest? Yep. All right, very good. Um, so some of this may be a little familiar to you. So my goals today for, are really to review the basics of amniotic fluid dynamics and what is amniotic fluid and why is it important, uh, to review the methods and techniques for estimating amniotic fluid volume with ultrasound. And we're going to talk about some examples of how you can integrate this into your practice uh, with uh, uh, assessments and some clinical vignettes as a, as a means to, to highlight how this can be used. So amniotic fluid is very important. It is necessary for normal fetal growth and development um, for a number of reasons. It protects the fetus from mechanical trauma. Um, it has bacteriostatic properties and therefore helps maintain a sterile intrauterine environment um, and provides space for fetal movement, uh, which really is important uh, for limb development and fetal breathing and swallowing motions of fluid, which are very crucial to lung development. And without amniotic fluid, those functions in, in development don't happen and have significant consequences. The volume of amniotic fluid in a typical gestation uh, is a complex balance of production and absorption. Um, it's a very complicated, uh, um, there are very complicated algorithms about how this is determined, but one thing that we do know is that it's uh, gestational age dependent. So you can see that this graph here on the right of the screen um, shows that by gestational age, as you increase, volume of amniotic fluid increases and peaks probably around 33, 34 weeks and then starts to decrease as you get closer to term. So what is considered normal and abnormal may depend on the gestational age. Um, ab abnormal amniotic fluid volume has terminology that goes with it. Polyhydramnios means having too much fluid and oligohydramnios means having not enough fluid. Um, these conditions or, abno or abnormal amniotic fluid can signify the pres presence of pathologic conditions that may increase uh, a pregnant mother and her fetus's risk for adverse perinatal outcomes. So there's a great role for you to be able to do this in your own practice. Um, like I had mentioned, I think you can greatly facilitate patient care, help answer questions, um, address symptoms that patients come in with uh, right there in the room at the bedside. Um, and what we're going to talk about in this talk should be limited towards uh, determining amniotic fluid volume for obstetric indications, so not just scanning um, just on patient request, the principle of Alera that we had talked about in a previous module, um, as low as reasonably achievable, um, and shouldn't really replace a formal ultrasound study if there's something that you find that is abnormal or borderline or are worried about, so that, that is always available to you. So we're going to talk about how we measure amniotic fluid now by ultrasound, um, which is really you know estimating amniotic fluid volume. There are a number of different types of measurements that can be done. Um, the amniotic fluid index is one that um, is very common. A two-dimensional pocket measurement is common. Single deepest pocket, and there are others. Um, no single method has ever been shown to be the primary method or the most valuable one clinically. Um, and so we're going to go over what is basically done in clinical practice as a, as a model for you to use in point of care application. So what I'd like you to think of as sort of the primary tool would be the amniotic fluid index, and we're going to get into that in a second. Um, and I think the single deepest pocket measurement is one that will be most useful in preterm gestations, and that will be explained in the, in the coming few slides. So when we sit down to do an ultrasound for amniotic fluid volume, there are a few things you want to do first, and these are some practical considerations. It's always a good idea to get the lay of the land, to briefly scan the uterus, to scan the fetus, to get an idea of um, a fetal heartbeat and fetal viability, to get an idea of fetal lie and presentation, which way is this baby positioned. Um, and then as we go to measure the amniotic fluid volume, the patient should be in the supine position. Um, you should be using the probe uh, and should be scanning perpendicular to the table or really perpendicular to the uterine contour. Um, and this generally is done in the sagittal orientation. So the notch on the probe is pointed towards uh, mom's head. 
So let's talk about the amniotic fluid index. So what you're going to do mentally is divide the uterus into quadrants. Um, and you're going to use the linea nigra in the midline uh, and the umbilicus to create that quadrantic view, which you can see there on the right. And what you're going to do is scan through each of those quadrants with the probe in the sagittal plane, you know, perpendicular to the contour of the uterus, and you're going to try to find the maximum vertical pocket of fluid in each quadrant. Um, you can't have fetal parts or umbilical cord present. It has to be just a fluid pocket. If they're transiently there and go away, that's okay. But um, you can use Doppler assessment and Doppler color flow to turn on that little window to see if there's blood flow there, to see if there's an umbilical cord present. Um, but you need to measure the deepest pocket of fluid that doesn't have any fetal parts or, or an umbilical cord. And you're going to add up the total from all four quadrants. On the bottom left, you can see a good example. That's a typical view of what you might see in quadrant three. Uh, as you can see that there's the calipers, um, and I'm going to highlight this here. Uh, here are the calipers measuring from the anterior to the posterior part of the uterus. I said quadrant three because it kind of looks like this is probably the fundus, and there's a posterior placenta sitting down here, um, and fetal parts are over on this side. So this is a nice pocket of fluid that they're measuring here. How do you interpret the results? Well, these are the kind of baseline uh, ranges in term gestations for what is normal and abnormal. Normal is in the 5 to 25 range. Oligohydramnios would be considered less than or equal to 5. Uh, and polyhydramnios would be greater than 25. Um, and again, if you get borderline results, AFI less than 7, less than 8, you can always consider repeating your study and averaging or repeating to get another look to see if just maybe, you know, the fetal position change, maybe you have a little a better pocket of fluid you can assess. Um, but it doesn't, doesn't hurt to try to repeat if you need to. The single deepest pocket is another technique I'd like for you to just have in your toolbox because it is very useful if you need to perform an ultrasound to estimate amniotic fluid volume in a preterm gestation. So this is actually scanning the entire uterus to find the single deepest pocket of fluid, as the name would suggest. Um, so again, it has to be a pocket of just fluid with no parts or cord. Um, and when you find that nice big pocket, the actual horizontal component of it needs to be at least a centimeter. So it's got to be a centimeter wide in order for you to really measure the depth and call it an actual pocket. Um, so as you can see in this picture here, our, our, our fetus is giving you the thumbs up that you found a really nice big pocket here. Um, and there's a pocket you would measure from here, from the placental surface, down towards the, the fetal extremity here. And that would be a nice pocket to measure. How do you interpret the results of single, single deepest pocket? Oligohydramnios would be under 2 centimeters. Normal would be somewhere between 2 and 8. And polyhydramnios, or too much fluid, would be uh, a depth greater than 8 centimeters. And again, this is important in preterm gestations because you're not going to have a uterus that's big enough to divide the abdomen into quadrants to measure four separate quadrants of fluid. You may only have just, you may see the entire baby and the entire amniotic sac all in one, um, one view with the, uh, with the ultrasound machine. So let's go over a couple cases to talk about integrating this into clinical practice. So the first case, we have a 27-year-old nulliparous patient. She's 38 weeks, presents for a routine prenatal visit. She's had an uncomplicated pregnancy, has no medical problems. She has no symptoms of labor. She's got no symptoms of rupture of membranes. She has a blood pressure of 116 over 72, and her uterine size is appropriate for her dates. She doesn't have any fetal movement over the past 12 to 15 hours, and she's concerned about it. So what would you do next? NST, so I heard NST. Anything else anyone would want to do? Maybe an amniotic fluid volume as well. Um, so both, I think, are, are important components of managing a patient who has decreased fetal movement at term, um, primarily because oligohydramnios may be associated with decreased fetal mov movement. It may be why the baby's not moving as much. There may be not enough space or uterine distension from having sufficient fluid for the baby to have normal movements. Um, and so they both can provide you with some degree of reassurance. A non-stress test will give you an idea that the uh, baby uh, is, uh, if there's a reactive non-stress test that predicts a very low risk of having a, a stillbirth or a, a fetus that's compromised. Um, and having normal amniotic fluid volume is certainly reassuring. Um, together, an amniotic fluid volume and a non-stress test can be uh, referred to as a modified BPP. So for those of you who have ever seen a BPP or, or know what a BPP is, it's an ultrasound assessment that contains four parameters, uh, fetal movement, fetal breathing, tone, um, and fluid volume, along with an NST and has a point system. Um, 
a modified BPP, which just is the fluid volume and the non-stress test, um, can be done a little bit more expeditiously. It's a faster ultrasound study and has um, as good of predictive values and as, uh, as, a, as a normal BPP. So the false negative rate is still very low, meaning that if you have a normal results, meaning reassuring testing, normal amniotic fluid volume, and a normal reactive NST, the likelihood of a stillbirth over the coming week is about 0.8 per thousand which is equivalent to a full BPP, which makes it a very useful thing to be able to do in the office. The other thing that's been shown with modified BPPs is that small numbers of patients actually end up needing a full BPP if you're worried about either of those two parameters on the study. So an NST and an amniotic fluid volume could give you very reasonable reassurance for this patient in the office. So let's look at one other case. Uh, an uncomplicated 21-year-old Gravita 1 pair 0 presents at 41 weeks and 0 days uh, for her routine prenatal visit. Her uterine size is also appropriate for dates and her blood pressure is normal. You check her cervix and it's one long and high and she is very motivated to enter labor spontaneously and, and doesn't want to absolutely be induced until it's medically indicated. So what testing if any is indicated during this coming week of pregnancy if you want to carry the pregnancy through 41 weeks? NST, NST anything else? AFI, good. Um, so both of those. So those are the two tests you need as you move past 41 and 0 um, through the 41st week of pregnancy. Um, the reason is is because the risk of stillbirth in pregnancy increases as you pass uh, term and is actually probably the lowest around 37 to 38 weeks. But again, there's still a risk of um, prematurity at that gestational age. Um, so as you pass 39, you start to hit more of the uh, exponential growth of this curve. And so um, you get to a rate of stillbirth that approaches, that, that, oh, that goes over one per 1,000 as you pass 41 weeks, which is why we need to um, do those tests for reassurance in the 41st week of pregnancy. Um, and so those are the two tests that are indicated. And with being able to do an amniotic fluid volume in the office, you may be able to save that patient a trip to an ultrasound unit or to a labor and delivery triage and be able to do both of those tests in the office uh, and really streamline uh, her care for her. So, in summary, amniotic fluid is a necessary uh, component for normal fetal growth and development. Abnormal amniotic fluid volume is associated with multiple pregnancy uh, complications and a risk for adverse perinatal outcomes. Uh, there are many techniques that you can use to do an amniotic fluid volume assessment. Um, the two that I think are going to be most useful to, to learn initially would be the amniotic fluid index, measuring quadrants uh, for a term gestation, and a single deepest pocket, uh, which can be used in preterm gestations. Um, formal obstetric ultrasound should always be obtained and is available if you have borderline uh, or abnormal results. Questions for him anyway.